So uh, Darshan is a bachelor from PES uh, University, Bangalore. He worked in Tectronics, MathWorks, and now works for Intel. Very much, he has the compiler's view on things, right? Uh, primary area of focus has been compilers. That's what uh, we know. And with seven plus years of industry experience, uh, let's say uh, let's see how things look like from the compiler's perspective. So over to you, Darshan. Hello. Thank you, Ankur. Thanks for the introduction. So let me share my screen and. Uh, Presenting. Let me know once you are seeing my screen. Yes, we do see your screen. All right. So let's uh, let's actually start today's talk. So this is the agenda that uh, I have planned for today. So I'll start with a uh, brief introduction about myself, and next will be like what to basically expect from this talk and what not to. Then going further, we'll see, uh, we'll start with the motivation for the compiler itself. Uh, and then see some of the compiler families. Uh, then going over very briefly, like about risk and sys, we'll not have a debate there. We'll just see risk and uh, sys from the compiler's perspective. Then we'll start the introduction to Clang and LLVM. And I'll be showing you some of the cool optimization that is uh, done using LLVM on the C++ code. So if time permits at the end, uh, we'll see a very brief introduction to this term called JIT, because that's becoming incrementally famous nowadays. So we'll see how the time permits for us. All right. So yeah, so Ankur has already given an introduction about uh, um, myself. And uh, so I've done basically electronics and communication engineering from PS University. And then I started uh, working uh, in my first company. And soon I realized that I, I know nothing about coding. So that's when I decided to pursue masters uh, in information and technology in IIIT Bangalore. So after finishing my masters, like my degree says, so I, I had a bachelor's in hardware and uh, masters in software. So I decided to work in between hardware and software. So compiler seems to be a natural area for me. And I uh, basically started working in that domain. So I'm currently employed by Intel. So going next, so what to expect from this talk? So basically I'm not, I don't want to claim that I'm a C++ expert because like uh, C++ is ever evolving la language and as all of uh, us know that uh, we'll be learning new things on a day-to-day -day fashion about uh, the language itself. Um, and uh, this talk is more about how a compiler basically sees a language and not about the C++ advanced concept and tricks. So what I thought is actually having this compiler knowledge uh, will give us more insight and more confidence uh, about the language itself. The basics of uh, LLVM and the compiler, uh, that's what I'm going to talk uh, in this presentation. and. Uh, it's, it will not be again an advanced um, uh, talk on compilers itself, right? So, yeah. So before I start, um, you, you can interrupt me anytime, and we can actually make it more interactive session actually. Uh, and also, like um, one more introduction about my luck is that my code will crash on the demo day, and the uh, internet will fluctuate on the presentation day. So if that happens, this bear with me, and it's already happened. So yeah, so with that, let me, and so let's start with the puzzle actually. So I'm showing you a assembly snippet. Can anybody take a guess what this is doing? Uh, is, is this multiplying two numbers to get uh, a okay. number? Okay, anything else? Some kind anything of decision else? operation. Okay, <laughs> okay. So, yeah, so actually it's a reminder operator. Uh, it's a very just like one line of code in C or C++, right, if you see. But um, uh, if you're seeing this assembly, right, it looks very cryptic. And uh, you have to believe that this is what the hardware will execute ultimately, right? So 
So you, even for one line of code, and it will be expanded into multiple lines of assembly, and it's very hard to actually uh, read or understand what's happening. And you have to believe me that the upper uh, assembly snippet and the uh, lower assembly snippet are doing the exact same thing. Even though they look uh, different, uh, they are actually doing the same stuff of calculating the remainder of the input. The only thing is that I have compiled it with uh, different compiler option, one with a higher level of optimization rather with the lower level of optimization. So we, are, we are trying to see like what exactly uh, uh, the optimization means in the later slides. But here I wanted to give you a motivation that uh, how hard it can be to read an assembly and make sense out of it without a, a compiler. Right, so with that, just go to the next slide and uh, try to see a kind of motivation for the need for a compiler. So like, like I mentioned, like hardware understand only bits, right? Like, or as you can say that assembly is a language to talk with hardware. And only crazy people write code in assembly. That's what I can say today. But uh, not so long ago, people used to hand optimize or hand write assemblies whenever they wanted com uh, more performant code. This is the time when the comp compilers were not mature enough or else they did not have any compilers for the target the targeted hardware, right? But not anymore. The modern compilers, uh, I can with confidence say that will easily outperform reason reasonably handwritten assembly. So if you take an engineer who's completely writing a, a code in assembly language and a, a very powerful compiler, so compiler will win most of the time. That's what I can see. And uh, and again, like we have n number of hardwares present in the market today, right? If you if you take x86 family, ARM family, MAPS, uh, and and even other uh, uh, custom hardwares, like, so there are like thousands of hardware uh, hardwares available in the uh, in the market today. If you want to retarget the same code, the same logic that you are writing in a high level high level language. To these multiple uh, hardware, it will become very difficult without a compiler. But with, with the help of compiler, it will just happen uh, uh, in, in a single flag or a single switch, right? So it will be easy to retarget with a compiler. And uh, as a last point, I wanted to make us happy by saying that uh, the high level languages. Uh, that people are using today, right? Those are sort of built on top of the hard work done, done by the compiler. Uh, because ultimately, even if it is uh, any high level language, they have to touch the hardware at some level, right? So so, uh, so in the sense that they will kind of use runtime libraries provided by the maybe uh, the compiled languages to uh, do the interpreted kind of execution, right? So if you, if you take the example of Python itself, the classic Python is called C Python uh, that uses the runtime library written in uh, C language, which is a compiled language. Uh, to do the interpretation, right? So that's something to feel happy about the day-to-day -day work that we are doing at our C++ language level. Okay, so yeah, the next slide is about uh, the different architectures that I just mentioned, right? Like, uh, so we have x86, uh, ARM, and uh, here I'm showing you MIPS as well. So the, if you take the same piece of code and look at the assembly for them, right? So they look entirely different, basically. So if you are if you know how to read the assembly for x86, you can make out that uh, uh, we are we, we are using the registers like RAX, RCX, RDX, and the instruction like IML. Whereas if you go to ARM, right, the, the register names are changed to W8X8, that kind of thing, and even the instructions are entirely different. So there's no connection between uh, the assembly language written in uh, uh, one architecture family to the other. Similarly for the MIPS, but if you if you look at it, the source of origin is the same. Right? So that's what I meant regarding the retargeting using the compiler. But uh, with the help of compiler, you can actually take the same piece of code and uh, target it for multiple hardware uh, in a very easy fashion. Right? So, yeah. So with that, I wanted to uh, talk a little bit about the compilation system versus the compiler because we use this word interchangeably and there's a slight difference. Um, so if you... So if you take a, a source program written in C or C++, so this is how the child will look like uh, from the starting uh, in the high level language uh, to, to when you actually reach the uh, executable, right? So we will have preprocessors uh, beginning at the child, uh, uh, which will actually expand your preprocessor directives and uh, use a hash include 
files to actually go for the function definitions, things like that. And uh, you'll get a modified source program after preprocessor. Then the uh, actual compiler work will start, uh, which actually construct something called, uh, which will actually do lexing, parsing, and uh, constructing the AST, then doing the optimizations, things like that. And ultimately, emitting the assembly file. So at this stage, the job of the compiler will be kind of over, uh, classically speaking, uh, the stage where we are generating the assembly file. So later, we will have to invoke uh, uh, the tools like assembler and linker to actually get till the executable. So again, you can use the assembler of your choice, like GNU assembler or uh, VASM, MASM from Microsoft or NLVM inbuilt. Uh, similarly, when you when you are looking at the linker, right, you can use your own linker, uh, GNU LD, GNU Gold, uh, and LLVM LLD, things like that. So what I wanted to convey here is, uh, so uh, basically these are called the uh, tool chain, compiler tool chain or compiler drivers. But with the modern compilers, right, all these are kind of integrated. Like you don't have to do each step separately uh, to get, uh, get to till the executable. So, but uh, but this is the uh, internal difference and the internal stages of the compiler, basically. And uh, 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 this is what you need to do till you get the executable. Similarly, at the linker stage, like shown in this example, your hello.object file may be having a library function called printf. And the linker's job is to actually search for that definition and do the uh, simple resolutions and uh, finally get the executable. Right, uh, so with the help of Clang, actually you can tag the output at different stages. So if you want to understand the language uh, in a better fashion, or maybe to debug something at different stages, you can use these switches to, to tap the output at different points and uh, uh, try to see what's happening. For example, if you are using hyphen E switch with the Clang, right, uh, you will get the pre-processed output. Similarly, uh, if you use hyphen S flag, um, you will get the assembly output. That means tapping at this stage. And um, uh, let me just try to pick a pointer. Yeah, tapping at this stage. So similarly, uh, with hyphen C flag, you can uh, get the uh, object file out of your source code. Uh, if you don't give any option, uh, typically it will try to compile it to exe, provided your source program is having in pain or the enter point. Right. So with that, let's try to see what are the different uh, famous compiled languages that are av uh, available. Today, this is not an exhaustive list, but this kind of listing the famous compiled languages and the famous target for them. So we have C, C++, then Rust is getting incrementally famous. Then we have Go from Google and uh, there is Java. So uh, there is a debate about Java saying that whether it's a compiled or an interpreted language and it used to be one of the favorite uh, interviews questions. So the answer is like Java is kind of uh, compiled uh, as well as interpreted language. Because what it will do is it will first compile the Java into something called bytecode and then later uh, it use JVM to kind of uh, go into interpreted mode of uh, mode for the uh, generated bytecode. So that's why I kind of try to put the Java in term, uh, also in this list uh, because it will compile it into bytecode. Uh, this will be the target for Java. Similarly, if you look at the other target, right? We have x86R and even WebAssembly. So web assemblies are like the native codes that can be even run in, natively in the web browsers. So those can be uh, even the target for high level language. So what I wanted to convey here is, so you need not have the binary kind of target. Uh, if you take x86 and ARM, those are like uh, the uh, code which can be directly run into hardware, right? So don't need, so only those need not be your target, target uh, language. So even, even the high level language can be still compiled into some more high level language itself, like bytecode or WebAssembly. Right? So still the terminology is called compiler because we are doing translation of one language to another. Yeah, going next. Uh, so these are the famously available C++ compilers today. So again, this is not an exhaustive list, uh, but these are the things which are available uh, in the market as of today. And uh, on the right hand side, I'm trying to show the maximum standard C++ standard, the different compilers are actually supporting. So uh, we have Clang, that is the main focus for uh, today's talk. Uh, and then we have GCC uh, by GNU from a long time. And then we have AOCC from AMD, MSVC from Microsoft. ICC is the compiler for Intel and ARMCC is from, uh, for ARM. 
right? But uh, in today's talk, we'll be mainly concentrating about Clang because uh, uh, it's also getting very famous and uh, uh, actually uh, it's built on top of the LLVM framework that I'm going to explain next. So, okay, let's take a look at what is LLVM basically. So LLVM stands for low level virtual machine. Uh, uh, so the project started in 2000. Uh, so it, it's an open source project. And the main motivation to start this project is to have a common intermediate representation for multiple languages. Because like I, like I showed you, right? Like high level language can be anything. Again, the backend can be anything. Um, and similarly, there were a lot of compiler pro, uh, uh, compilers available in the market. So like it will become very com uh, complex uh, unless you have a very common representation to lower the different languages to uh, uh, this kind of common representation and have a, a systematic way of kind of optimizing them. So the LLVM project actually aimed at there and making the language more uh, modular as well as extensible. So uh, like I mentioned, uh, like I showed you the different languages, right? So each language will uh, come up with its own front end. The job of the front end is to kind of lower the language which is written high level to this common representation called LLVM. So from there, different backends are uh, written to lower them further to the actual target. So you see that it's done in a very modular way. Like for example, Clang uh, is a front end for C and C++ language. Similarly, there is LLGO front end to lower the Go to LLVM representation. Similarly, Flang is for Frotron uh, and Rust is having its own uh, front end basically to uh, convert the language written in uh, Rust to LLVM. So once you come to LLVM representation, then the optimizations and the lowering uh, part will be common. And ultimately, depending on the target hardware, it will be further lower. So we're going to see exactly uh, uh, how, how it's kind of done in the other uh, slide, but I just wanted to give you a overview before that. So going next, so before actually delving into LLVM and Clang, I just wanted to give a brief introduction about something called instruction set architecture. Because the moment we are talking, uh, I mean, computer architecture and another from the uh, source language. So unless you, you know something about uh, the hardware, it, it will be slightly difficult for you to appreciate what compiler is doing. So that's where I thought, let me just give you a very brief introduction about uh, what is instruction set architecture. Yeah, is there any question? Okay, so like uh, uh, instruction, yeah. Uh, can you please uh, tell that uh, when to use which compiler like a Clang or GCC, uh, what will be the priority and the priority? Uh, <laughs> so I don't know, like it's difficult to, your question itself is anti controversial because I cannot claim one couple that's better than the other. But I think, so I don't know, it depends on the uh, experience of the developer. Like a lot of things uh, will come into picture. So, like the experience with the debugger, experience with the uh, better optimization. Uh, and also, if you are natively developing in Windows, people will mostly use, I think, uh, MSVC. Uh, so, like, uh, it's, there is no definitive answer, I guess. But uh, if anybody over the call is having expertise, please uh, feel free to chime in. I think it depends. The answer is it depends. Because, like, uh, what I've seen is sometimes Clang will do better optimization on a certain code, uh, and sometimes GCC will do better optimization on the same code. So, it depends. Uh, so, so, typically, what I've seen in the industry is from the from the legacy thing itself, some compiler tool chain will be set up already GCC or uh, Clang. That's what predominantly is being used. But what I would like to emphasize is Clang is getting more and more stronger and more and more modular. That's what is the aim for this talk. So I would definitely encourage you to explore Clang. Thank you. Yeah. Actually, most compilers would do a similar job and a good job. Uh, yeah. Like Darshan also said, give and take some, uh, you know, some parts one compiler will optimize and reduce one less instruction than the other. <laughs> so it's not that much to choose. Uh, the non-technical aspects also become a, a factor of choice, like platform uh, is definitely technical, but platform, if you're on Windows, 
MSVC becomes an option, otherwise it's not. And uh, whether you want to pay or you want to use is uh, you use a free one is also one of the factors. If you're working on an embedded one, maybe you want to uh, try one over the other, which is better suited for your environment. So uh, the considerations for the company right. may be different. Yeah, Vishal? Yes, I just was going to say that I think also the other point is that uh, Clang is act or Clang LLVM also is better to create tooling uh, such as you have Clang Tidy, et cetera, that can yeah. kind of. Uh, hold on, hold on. It's there in my next presentation. <laughs> so, yeah, I was going to talk about that actually in the next slide, but glad that you mentioned, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, so going next, so I just wanted to introduce about, uh, so you may be familiar with this term called infrastructure architecture if you are mostly working with hardware or embedded domain, right? So these are kind of uh, set of instructions defined by the hardware. Um, so like I showed you, right, x86 and uh, ARM, right? So these kind of instructions are, are sort of, you can also view them as a syntax uh, defined by the hardware family. So these will act as the primary abstraction between the hardware and software. So if you want to communicate or uh, execute anything with the hardware, you will have to ultimately do using one of these instructions, right? So that means ultimately your high level language at some point should touch this instruction. And also important thing, also I had this confusion earlier uh, uh, myself before I, uh, I started working in compilers that so, so x86 and ARM are like uh, different sort of syntax or different sort of flavors and not tied with basically any, any organization or any company, right? So x86 vendors can be seen as uh, different vendors can be like Intel, AMD, it's a company called VIA and Zoxin. Uh, so multiple vendors can implement the same, uh, same syntax and make their hardware compatible with the instruction set architecture. Similarly for ARM, uh, Apple, Broadcom, Nvidia, Samsung, so all of them produces hardware which are compatible with uh, the ARM architecture. So the, la the architecture or the instruction set architecture itself is not tied with any vendor. For example, so here if you see the instruction IM1, different vendors could have been implemented uh, using their own uh, uh, log hardware logic, right? So IM1 could have been implemented using multipliers or shifters in uh, in one vendor or maybe using adders at the hardware level <coughs> by some other vendor <coughs> sorry <coughs> so basically that is termed as micro architecture <coughs> whereas uh, the high level syntax is called instruction set architecture so we are not um, mainly worried about micro architecture because uh, that will be vendor specific so this is uh, one thing to note here Again, going into the next slide, uh, here again, don't ask me which one is better <laughs> because this is also like uh, kind of, uh, we don't, let's not have a debate, but I'm just, uh, I just wanted to show you RISC versus SIS. So SIS uh, stands for uh, Complex Instruction Set Computer. RISC stand, stands for uh, Reduced Instruction Set uh, Computer. As the name itself suggests, right? So SIS will uh, actually, uh, SIS introduced instructions which are slightly complex. That means one instruction itself will do multiple jobs. Like I'm showing you here, uh, there is one instruction which is reading from the memory address A, then doing a multiplication with code with the register R2, and then adding a scalar value of one and ultimately return the result back to another register called R1. So if you see within the one instruction, so many things are performed. So so, uh, so uh, the greater complexity lies with the processor in case of this. Whereas, <clears throat> if you look at the philosophy of RISC, right? <clears throat> what they did is, <clears throat> instead of having such a complex instructions, sorry. <clears throat> so they broke this instruction into multiple small instructions. So that was the philosophy for RISC. The same thing is written in, uh, in terms of multiple instructions here, right? So uh, each doing a small, small operation. Okay, so and in case of CISC, it can be variable length, whereas in case of RISC, generally it will be uh, fixed length. So what will happen is in case of, uh, so I'm talking purely from the compiler's perspective, what will happen is 
uh, if you are having a sys processor right so compiler actually needs to map uh, uh, the source instruction which actually uh, compiler uh, need to kind of com uh, combine multiple source instruction into kind of uh, one sys instruction uh, which is there to do that job uh, sometimes um, so the pattern matching has to happen to actually uh, kind of uh, get the exact instruction in the sys whereas in case of sys sometimes what will happen is source language will have will have a, a high level instruction uh, like mac or maybe uh, maybe uh, some single processing uh, function so it needs to be broken down into multiple small small uh, kind of uh, uh, instructions so compiler has to break down the complex instruction complex source code into multiple um, smaller uh, uh, assembly code while lowering right so uh, so there is a difference from the uh, compiler's perspective uh, so but having said that in the modern day processors there is no clear demarcation on uh, sys what versus sys because if you see like most processors uh, uh, i mean some processors will use the instructions which are complex again uh, other instructions may be doing a simple task so there is no clear demarcation like uh, risk and sys is kind of uh, so they have taken the best from the both world Uh, and implement, implementing the modern day processors. Yeah, going next. Uh, if you have any more question in the previous slide, um, is about the compiler uh, anatomy. So uh, let's take a look at what are the different <clears throat> parts that are available in the compiler. Uh, uh, I have already told you about front end and back end kind of. Uh, you will 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 in the uh, will showing the previous presentations uh, previous slides basically but see what is the exact job of these three components right the front end like i mentioned it has to take the <coughs> source language it written in a high level language and convert it into something called <coughs> abstract syntax tree we are going to see what what is that exactly next um, <coughs> and then <coughs> front end will do <coughs> some kind of ast transformation to actually transform from one form to another which we are going to see in examples in the future slides and ultimately low, uh, lowering it, it to something called the common representation in our case llvm ir so once you have a llvm ir you will do various kind of um, optimizations uh, and analysis onto it and you will further uh, uh, reduce it and and move the make the ir more performant or more simpler and ultimately in the back end instruction selection will happen that means it will actually go into the uh, particular targeted hardware level and try to match the registers which are available in the hardware it will do things like that that it will be, look more and more uh, like uh, like a assembly code and ultimately the assembly emission will happen in the back end so the front end part and back end uh, parts are uh, configurable and you can actually plug in you are on back end <coughs> in case you are uh, having your own custom hardware so it's very easy to modify uh, in the llvm that's why it's also becoming very famous right so it's easy to kind of retarget for any custom hardware so having said that i'm in this slide i'm showing you uh, the technique called progressive lowering that's uh, employed by uh, um, all the compiler so what uh, compilers will do is it will take the high level language and kind of lower it progressively like i mentioned first it will construct ast then it will go to llvm ir then it will uh, go to machine ir then ultimately it will go to the assembly if you look at here at the upper side of the stack right uh, you will see the ast wherein it will look more and more like a high level language it's preserving the semantics of high level language right it is keeping the data type It's keeping the binary operators, things like that, uh, at the AST level. Whereas, if you look at the machine, uh, uh, machine IR, right? It is looking more and more like an assembly language, right? So, so that's how the progressive lowering done uh, in in the compiler in the compiler term terminology. So, yeah. So, I I I have a bad habit of asking, uh, why can't we do it in a simpler way? whenever people show me a complex thing right so that's what i asked my seniors when i when i started my career in compilers also why do we have to do all these things building ast then lowering it to llvm ir then machine ir and why to bother so much why can't you because ultimately it looks like me like uh, source level language is also uh, uh, 
uh, is, is in form of string and uh, even the assembly language is also as a string, right? Ultimately, if you look at it, why can't we directly do some kind of string processing and uh, write a one pass compiler, right? So if you want to do that, let's try to do, do that exercise for uh, this particular code. Uh, yeah, so here uh, we are having a, a code written in uh, uh, C++, right? So what's happening is the moment you see a function definition, maybe you can emit a label in the assembly language. A uh, moment you see a addition operation in the source language, maybe you can emit a add, uh, add uh, uh, instruction in the assembly language, right? The moment you see in k equal to zero, you can do a move the, uh, with the knowledge of the assembly language. So what I'm saying is you can maybe write a, a, a one pass compiler, which will actually just look at the source code, which will scan the source code line by line and maybe do some kind of string processing and uh, generate assembly code. But the moment you see this kind of branching instruction or the for loop, things will get slightly complex, right? Because you'll have to emit a label and then <clears throat> insert a jump instruction to come back to the same label. Because in the assembly language, uh, we don't keep the same high level semantics of for loop, while loop, things like that, right? It has to be lowered into these labels and jump instructions. So things are getting slightly complex, but with our uh, string manipulation skill, maybe we can get away with that and do some kind of better pattern matching and complex pattern matching to do this, right? So what I'm saying is if some uh, highly skilled programmer is writing such kind of string manipulator, it's not that hard to this kind of conversion from one string to another string. But what I wanted to highlight is, did you observe that k equal to three here is a loop invariant and it, it could have been easily uh, hoisted out of this loop, right? So those kind of an analysis and those kind, kind of insights you will not get if you are directly doing this kind of one pass compiler. And it's, it will be, some optimizations will be impossible to write with, a, uh, with a, that kind of uh, 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 one pass compiler. That's what I want to highlight here. So similarly, if you take human perspective, right? I can ask you the question, what is three into four? And uh, uh, everybody will uh, answer me that it's 12. And I can ask similar question in a binary format. What is 0, 1, 1, 1 into uh, 0, 1, 0, 0. So you'll take some time to see what's happening here and what is what, uh, what is the interpretation of this binary and uh, then you will answer, right? So what I'm saying is sometimes the higher the abstraction, uh, uh, it's easy to do, it's easy to analyze and easy to do the optimization. The same thing with the compiler. Sometimes the higher the abstraction, you can uh, run certain analysis in an easy fashion, uh, whereas uh, you'll, you'll run machine specific optimization in the lower level. That's why compiler will employ the progressive lowering, keeping the higher level semantics uh, in the, uh, while constructing the ASP, then progressively lowering it into uh, the very low level of assembly. Right, I think with that motivation, uh, you should just agree with me, whatever I'm going to show in the next slide about ESC and the LLVM IR, and you should just assume that those are absolutely required for a compiler. Right, so let's see a Clang ASC and try to see how it looks like. So this is the source code written in C++ and this is how the ASC look like uh, when you dump it from Clang. Right, so uh, it's having uh, this translation unit decal uh, which will include all the source code present in the current file. Then there will be function declaration, which will in turn uh, comprises of compound statement and return statement. Uh, uh, so if you take the compound statement, right, it will be uh, having binary uh, operator. Similarly, the return uh, node will have a binary operator, uh, things like that. So if you carefully look at it, right, it will form a tree kind of structure, right? So function, uh, in this case, uh, if you take example of return statement, Written uh, statement is a, a top level node which contain, contains a binary node, which in turn again contain two values of uh, sum and uh, CC in this case. So this will form a nice tree kind of structure. Again, why tree kind of data structure? Why not some other data structure like linked list or some other thing? Uh, so it happens so that when you form tree from your uh, uh, source language, it will become very easy to do the analysis and very easy to manipulate things. For example, in this case, I can do an easy pattern match about this node and I can easily uh, do a pre-traversal kind of thing with sum and going into its parent as a uh, division operator and having another child as an integer uh, integer node. Then maybe I can replace it with some, some other library call 
uh, about uh, the integer division. Right? So those kind of pattern matching and those kind of analysis will become uh, very simple the moment you represent your uh, source code in terms of abstract syntax tree. Uh, similarly, going next. So I told you, right, at the AST stage itself, we will do some kind of transformation to make the things uh, simpler. So one such transformation is template instantiation. Right, so we have this concept called templates in C++, wherein you can write your code in a generic way without specifying the data types. Right, so here I'm I'm just writing this code which is uh, taking type name st, and the uh, type is actually deduced by this call uh, of foo. So here you can see that foo is making use of double data type, and uh, ultimately uh, the uh, the function uh, return type and the uh, input arguments all will become foo. Right. So that's what will be done at the AST stage itself. As you can see, the uh, AST for function foo is already uh, uh, denoted with the data type of double. Right? Similarly, at the call, caller stage, it's, it's already uh, uh, using the value of double. So that means type reduction is done at the AST stage itself, rather than going into lower level <coughs> in the chain and then doing the <coughs> type propagation. <coughs> right? Similarly, if you look at the auto reduction, right, it is the same as template reduction. So here I'm calling a function bar. Actually, the type of this particular variable m should be deduced from the written type of bar, right? So here, here it is taking an integer and then multiplying it with the float value, right? Here the type promotion will happen and ultimately the written value will become float. So as you can see in the AST, the value of m is already determined to be float. Similarly, the functor, the function declaration of the bar is already determined as uh, written time type as float and the input argument is as in. So the type reduction is already done at the AST stage itself. Right, so uh, those are some of the transformation done at the AST stage. I'm not showing you the other transformation at this stage, but uh, what I'm saying is, uh, so whatever possible, we try to do at the AST stage itself and then lower it to LLVMIR. Okay, so having said that, so once you build the AST from your source uh, language, right, there itself a lot of interesting projects can happen. Like somebody mentioned, like Vishal mentioned, right? So there is uh, this thing called uh, libtooling that the Clang will provide you. So what it will allow you is it will give you iterators and pattern matches that you can uh, nav uh, that you can navigate over the constructed AST and do a lot of code analysis, lot of cool code analysis. So Clang Tidy is the famous project which uses uh, lib tooling and comes up with 200 plus checks as of today. So some of the checks which I wanted to highlight here is like there are there are readability checks <coughs> which will identify the duplicate includes in your source code and there are these uh, redundant string in it, right? So for example, if you are initializing your string uh, with an empty string, it is not required, right? String uh, default constructor will itself will do that. So the client tidy check will uh, actually uh, actually add uh, kind of things and give you warnings and uh, and also the line numbers. Similarly, there are these performance checks like uh, string find is faster. It seems uh, when you use it in uh, single quotes rather than double quotes. That means if you are giving it as a char uh, overload, it is it is faster. So I also did not know about uh, uh, this fact. I just got to know while preparing this presentation. So what I'm saying is, it's hard to remember all these kind of tricks of C++, right? So in such cases, such tools like Clang Tidy will come in very handy. You can write your code and run such tools and uh, uh, find uh, catch all these things and make your code better and better. In fact, I have seen some patch raised in, into the LLVM community about uh, the rule of five and rule of three, that's, that kind of checks, right? We are having that discussion in the previous talk. So those kind of things are very hard to catch, but uh, with the with the AST representation and with the lib tooling, we can write such kind of uh, complex checks, uh, and then uh, uh, and then uh, make our code more performant. So I'm not explaining how to do that. So there is a nice blog in the Clang community itself how to start with the Clang tooling, uh, how to start with the lib tooling and uh, write your own checks. You can go through that and uh, make use of them. I think uh, Dhananjay has some uh, question. Dhananjay, you can unmute. Yeah, so I have a question that uh, if this lib tooling is used to do the static code analysis, like uh, the, we do using SonarCube or any other tool, so 
did sonarchy or kind of tools they do use this kind of lib tooling behind it uh, i'm not uh, sure about that tool uh, uh, but uh, but client id is for static uh, code analysis so i'm not aware of the tool which uh, you are asking but if anyone vishal or someone if they are aware maybe uh, can give the clarity okay so darshan you mean to say that that if i want to write my own tool okay to uh, do the static code analysis from my own code then i'll be able to do using the lib tooling correct right? yes 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 okay yeah you can, uh, uh, basically you can add your own check so what it will provide you lib tooling is is a iterator to iterate uh, through the uh, nodes of uh, constructed ast so you should have the knowledge about how the clang clang ast will look uh, data structure wise and then how, how to use the iterators then how to manipulate the ast from one form to another so basically that's all you need to write your own tools and uh, do this kind of checks okay yeah so if you go through i think this blog they they'll explain with an example nicely how to write your own check and uh, do the static analysis okay yeah Yeah, going next, right? So this is so once you have constructed the uh, AST, next step is to lower it into LLVM IR. That's what I told you, right? So this is how the LLVM IR will look like for the, the given function. So if you look at it, right? So this will the function name will be same, and the, uh, for the add uh, operation, we have generated this add instruction in LLVM, and uh, yes, still for the division operator, and there is the return instruction. So if you look at it, LLVM IR itself is like another language. that you are translating your source code into this particular representation similarly if you look at more complex code right this is how your uh, the llvm ir will look like uh, wherein um, the moment you encounter a branching we will form a new block called basic blocks so here if you can see the first basic block uh, contains the code till uh, the branching instruction and the moment you encounter the branching instruction right the new basic block will be formed with the label 7 and the another basic block which will be formed for the end instruction labeled with 10 so depending on the branching one of these basic block will be executed uh, right so this is how uh, the uh, ir is formed so if you look at it right so this will serve two purpose so you can assume that the codes which are inside a given basic block are linear so this will simplify lot of analysis and lots of lot of transformation that you are going to do on uh, llvm ir and uh, so if you think about your target assembly language right so assembly will not have such kind of branching and loops like i mentioned so those needs to be done using labels and uh, the jump instruction right so llvm ir is kind of moving towards that kind of um, semantic right so that's why we will form the basic block at this stage and uh, kind of lower uh, the ast in the form of uh, those kind of basic block so once you form uh, once you lower it into your llvm ir right so there are two phases now so you can run analysis certain analysis uh, in your ir or you can do transformation to your ir so analysis are kind of read only fashion that means you will just uh, uh, iterate over your ir and basic block and collect certain informations so that later they can be used in the uh, transformations to uh, do them effectively right uh, for example you can count how many add instructions are there in the given basic block you can count how many load instructions are there in a basic block using the llvm analysis later you can use that data uh, 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 so the analysis uh, data structures will be available uh, during the transformation phase and uh, in in the transformation you will actually modify the ir from one form to another form so you can think that analysis is is kind of read only whereas the optimizations are modifying the ir so these are the list of different kind of analysis that's that are available in the uh, uh, llvm and these are the different of uh, different types of optimizations uh, available in the llvm ir i am going to i am not going, going to show you all of them but i'll show you some of some of the uh, 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 powerful optimization in the later slide so uh, so one more thing which i want to highlight about the common representation is uh, 
so so uh, this serves the purpose of uh, code shareability as well right so if i write a optimization um, uh, uh, and uh, and push it to the community code so what will happen is uh, many front end can make make use of that right so the language uh, the source code written in go can lower in, it into llvm ir and make use of my optimization the source code written in rust can also be lowered into uh, llvm and can make use of the optimization uh, written here right so that is the power of having the common representation so that all this optimization that can be run at the ir level can be run on them and uh, uh, make make use of the uh, powerful optimization so for example i am showing you here one kind of type of uh, optimization called dead code elimination so here if you see the source code right what's happening is we are having this loop wherein uh, i am updating this thing called sum but ultimately while doing the return <coughs> operation this sum is not being used so basically uh, we are wasting the resource by uh, doing this kind of looping right so it's not even required at the final output so we can even eliminate this loop and it will not uh, make any difference to the numerical correctness of this particular function right so that's where uh, this kind of optimization called dead code elimination come into play so this is the initial ir uh, written, uh, converted uh, to llvm this how it will look like if you inspect this right at the label 8 we are having branch instruction to label 2 that means it's giving you this loop effect by doing this kind of branching so on running uh, this particular optimization right called dead code elimination your ir will become just two line right so it is having only this instruction called uh, add which is adding uh, n, which is exactly doing n plus 7 and returning that value right that is the power of Uh, this optimization is reducing from so many lines to only two lines just imagine if you are generating assembly uh, from this initial ir you will be having around 20 easily 20 plus lines of code in the final assembly whereas if you such the, uh, if you do such kind of powerful optimization and ultimately lower it into assembly you will end up having only one line right so that is the power of having uh, um, uh, this kind of optimization and the common representation right so going next uh, we are having another optimization called const expr so if you are aware we can use this const expr keyword on, uh, on in your function and what we are telling is at the compile stage itself evaluate this fibonacci function and give me the constant value so at the compile stage itself it will actually evaluate it will, it will push this 26 to this function and do the recursion and get you the constant value at the right so this kind of optimization is also done at the uh, compilation stage itself and uh, very interesting thing to note here is it is done at the ast stage it's not done at the ir stage because as you can see if i dump the initial ir right so uh, the initial ir itself is having the constant value of 121393 which is the fibonacci for 26 right so that means this transformation is already done while within the ast and uh, evaluating the uh, part of that ast and getting the constant value right so i am not explaining you how it is done but there is a talk in youtube on how clang actually evaluates the const expr and uh, uh, and builds and transform the ast you can go through that right so this is about const expr so next uh, uh, next tool optimization is inter procedural optimizations so generally the most of the optimizations written in llvm ir will do like per function fashion they will not look across the function and try to do the things but uh, there are some advanced transforms like inter procedural transform constant propagation which will try to look across the function boundary and try to uh, try to kind of uh, do more optimization so in this case also i just modified the previous example and what i have done is in this fibonacci function right depending on the input value it will return 21 if it is greater than 0 or else it will return a constant value of 7 so here uh, from the caller if you see it's always uh, forcing the value of 26 right so that means it will always return the value of 21 it will not go to the uh, uh, else branch in this case so here at the compile time itself we can uh, do this kind of constant propagation and maybe completely eliminate this function call right that's what this particular optimization does if you see the initial uh, ir you will have kind of two uh, two irs uh, having a one ir one ir uh, having a function called to the another another function like um, 
here uh, the function foo is having the function called to uh, pi and pi is having the branching code here right so but after this particular uh, constant propagation transformation uh, this particular ir will be reduced to just one line of re returning 21 because it, it could identify that this, this is just a just a constant value and i can just return 21 right so like the same thing here so if you are lowering from the initial ir to assembly you will be having easily like uh, 20 or 30 plus lines of code whereas if you lower from the opti optimized ir right you will end up having just one line in the assembly right this will make huge huge difference in the performance so and one more thing to note here is the name of the functions are slightly different compared to the source language so this is called the name mangling in the uh, compiler technology so this is done uh, to avoid the name collision uh, uh, for the same functions written in, in the form of function overloads or the same functions present in the different namespaces right so they generally kind of uh, modify the name to uh, name to little bit uh, while uh, lowering the ir and the similar can be seen even in the object symbols if you are whenever you try to uh, read the object code right so this is called the name mangling in the compiler technology. So, so this was about the constant propagation optimization in uh, this present in the compiler. So having said this, what I wanted to introduce is uh, some of the tricky optimizations that can be there in the compiler. So I am showing you two pieces of code. Okay, so twiddle one and twiddle two. So what it's doing is it's just doing uh, uh, the addition of two, uh, two pointers here. So like um, here, if you see it's doing XP equal to XP plus YP. Similarly, uh, the second line is doing the value in XP equal to value in XP plus YP, right? The same code is repeated twice. So should compiler do this kind of optimization? So because it will be, it looks exactly equivalent, right? So it can do XP equal to XP plus two star YP, right? So should we do this kind of optimization or not? So can you tell me, some somebody in the call, can, we just, can you just tell me, should we do as a compiler engineer, should you write a transformation which actually does this kind of thing? Two ports are equivalent. I'll go, maybe um, the code is equivalent, definitely. But the costs in terms of how many instructions or mm -hmm. the time it takes may not be equal. Mm -hmm. So I okay. think uh, the compiler will okay. have to take into account both of those and might even do the reverse of what you do. If you okay. try to replace your left-hand side code with the right-hand side, the compiler okay. may put, put the left-hand side back depending okay. on okay. its knowledge of the cost. Okay, thanks. Any, any, any other answers before I show you the thing? Yeah, I think it is similar to Ankur's answer. Mm -hmm. Like it will take more instruction cycles to execute on the left hand okay. side compared to the right hand side. Okay. Okay. But uh, unfortunately, you are wrong. So the thing is, these two codes are not always equivalent because I just think in the case where uh, these are pointers, right? Just assume the case wherein both XP and YP are pointing to the same memory location, right? So what will happen, let's take an example and try to evaluate these two pieces of, piece of code. So let's say that XP and YP are pointing to the same memory location. So uh, those two should have the same value, right? Let's say that th those are having the indi uh, integer value of two. So what will happen in the first case is XP and YP both are two and you will do XP equal to two plus two and XP will be updated to four in the first case, right, in the first line. The moment XP got updated, YP will also change because those two are pointing to the same memory location. Now YP will also automatically become four. So in the next line, you will ultimately doing XP equal to four plus four. You are getting the point, right? So ultimately the answer will be eight. XP will hold the value of eight. Whereas if you look at on the right hand side, XP and YP both are two to begin with. What you will do is you will do XP equal to two plus two star two. That's what you will do. The ultimate answer here will become six. So these two code are not numerically equivalent. So that is the very tricky part, right? So like, uh, uh, so compiler 
should always ensure the numerical correctness because if i give you a very cool optimization and tell you that uh, this will sometimes produces correct code sometimes it produces wrong code but it will it will run super fast nobody will accept that right so that's why compiler needs to be very very uh, conservative while doing the optimization and it has to always guarantee the numerical correctness so so these two codes are uh, not equivalent uh, the moment they are aliased so the compiler has to do uh, some kind of analysis like alias analysis to be sure if it is going ahead with such kind of transformation to make sure that these two pointers will never overlap so uh, i am generating assembly with this and you can see that each time it will actually reload the value from the memory refresh the value from the memory to get the uh, new address that's why the moment you please be careful uh, while you are using pointers in your code because most of the optimizations will be bailing out the moment it says pointers it will say okay let me be more conservative and uh, let me not run uh, this kind of optimization so it's always try to kind of uh, 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 try uh, it's better to avoid the pointers wherever possible if you are looking more towards perform performance aspect but sometimes you cannot avoid and uh, just play with them having said that uh, so uh, you are right uh, that those two codes were equivalent the moment you tell the compiler using some kind of hints right so i am showing you uh, this particular keyword card restrict keyword that exists uh, in in c++ what uh, it will tell the compiler is that these two pointers will never overlap okay so that means compiler is kind of uh, guaranteed that these two memory locations are these two values are pointing to different memory location and it can now go ahead and do the optimization that i showed you earlier and that's how the assembly will look like now right so the new assembly will just do that it will do add of the same value two times essentially doing the two into yp the old whereas the old thing was different it's actually doing uh, it's actually reloading the value from the memory each time so that's what like sometimes if you want to get the last mile performance from your code right you'll have to hint the compiler sometimes compiler can only reach so far with the knowledge of uh, so with the hint from the actual programmer it can it can actually uh, get the last mile performance similarly there are other pragmas available in clang like uh, unroll uh because compiler will also again use some kind of heuristics to unroll the loop or not similarly with respect to inline right it will use some kind of heuristics to should i inline the body of the function or not so in such cases it will rely on the programmers to give that particular attributes or the prag mask to hint the compiler that it's safe to unroll or safe to do the inlining and uh, so yeah by by doing that kind of thing you can actually achieve more performance but the moment you break your contract be ready to face the undefined behavior Yeah, that is the kind of uh, uh, nature. Uh, the moment you are you are telling uh, telling to uh, using the restrict keyword, but somehow in your program, let's say that they are pointing to the same memory location, then the code will break. Yeah. So having said that, I am just showing you the SSA form of LLVM because we will be hearing this terminology the moment you read something about compiler. So so if you see here the LLVM IR, right? here there is this variable called sum and the value of file in the llvm ir correspond to this particular variable sum because it's uh, because it's doing the multiplication operation right so phi uh, if you trace back from llvm to source code phi is representing sum here whereas if you see the next line in the source code it's overwriting the same value in the uh, of the sum right in the source code whereas interesting thing is happening in llvm is creating the new value of 6 It's not using the same previous value of phi. It is creating the new value. So the equivalent version of the source code uh, will be something like this. You will be using sum in the next statement, but create a new variable, right? Call someone, and then maybe return someone. So these two programs are semantically exactly equivalent, right? So this this the second form of the program is called uh, static single assignment. Now uh, that means each overwrite of a variable will be done with a new definition. of the variable and then ultimately using uh, the new definition in the uh, rest of the places so why it is done because the compiler research or the compiler theory says that the moment you go to ssa form lot of your analysis uh, will be simplified and uh, it will be very easy to do the transformation that's where the uh, uh, the ir itself will be compatible with the ssa form i'm just introducing to this uh, terminology because the moment you are reading something about compiler we will end up hearing this term
So having said that, let me try to quickly show you the analysis, uh, some kind of analysis that's there in the LLVM so that we can do some of the cool transformations. This is called used if analysis. It's widely used across all the transformations. It's very, very simple. Like if you take uh, one instruction in the LLVM uh, and then maybe uh, uh, look at where it is used, right? If you take the load instruction as the depth instruction, next null instruction will become its use instruction because it's using the value of three as one of the operand. Similarly, if you take add instruction as a depth instruction, the return instruction will become the use instruction of add because it's using the value of six in your instruction, right? So there can be one def def uh, uh, def uh, definition, uh, I mean, depth instruction, and there can be multiple use instruction for the same depth instruction. So, so this analysis, use depth analysis, will give you a data structure wherein you can query given, a uh, given any instruction, it, you can iterate over uh, its uh, use of uh, use instructions, or you can query how many users exist for the particular given def instruction. So with this information, so can somebody in the call tell me, how will you write a trivial dead code elimination using this analysis? So what, what we want to do is uh, writing some kind of dead code elimination pass and remove certain instruction, right? Which are kind of sort of dead using this particular analysis. Can you think, how can you do that using this particular analysis? Anybody in the call? So what this analysis is giving you is uh, given any instruction, it will tell you how many users for this that instruction are there. Yeah, Zozo has uh, replied in the chat saying use instruction is zero. Yes, exactly. Exactly, right? So very simple. Like uh, take any instruction and then see how many users like this. If there are zero users, why are you keeping that instruction? Just remove it. Right, it's as simple as that using this particular uh, analysis. Right? Yeah, you guys are becoming compiler engineers. <laughs> this tag, yeah. So that is that simple using this particular uh, analysis. Yeah, so like, uh, let me quickly, uh, I know I'm overshooting the time. Let me quickly uh, go into the next phase. So once you, once you have the very optimized IR, right? So next step is to lower it further to something called machine IR. So, so there are phases like instruction selection and register allocation, things like that, wherein you, now you will look into the machine specific uh, uh, information, like how many registers are present in my uh, uh, hardware or how many, uh, so what is the exact instruction that's present for the add or sub or div. You will try to lower your uh, LLVM IR. Remember LLVM IR is uh, 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 machine agnostic. That means it, uh, it will have generic instruction. Right? But the moment you go into the machine specific IR called machine IR, it will contain more and more information about your machine. For example, this is the example for x86 architecture. You can see a register like EDI, e, EAX present already. The moment you come so far until the machine IR, then uh, there is the last phase called emitter phase, wherein it will become very trivial to kind of uh, write a very simple pattern matches, wherein you can do one by one uh, translation of machine IR to assembly. So it will become very simple to emit assembly the, the moment you come to machine. I'm not going to show that phase. So uh, here I'm just telling you about the modularity of LLVM, like I uh, told you in the beginning, right? This project is more modular compared to the other compilers. That means you can tap the output at different stages. Like if you want the AST dump of your source code, you can just do hyphen X clang and AST dump and get the AST of your source code. RS with hyphen S and hyphen emit LLVM keyword, you can just get the dot LL. That means the LLVM IR for the given source code. Next, you can maybe feed that generated L, uh, dot LL file and use this tool called opt and then specify only required optimization. In this case, ADSC stands for aggressive or dead code elimination. So I can run only certain optimizations on my LLVM. So this will become very powerful in debugging. So if I want to debug my optimization that I'm newly, newly writing, I can just run only that on my input IR and then See what's going on by inspecting the output, right? So ultimately, there is this LLC tool wherein you can invoke the backend using MR and MCPU uh, flags, and then specify the hardware information there, and take the input uh, LL and then ultimately convert it into dot S format, right? So this is the modularity of LLVM tool, and uh, using that, uh, um, you can actually it will become very easy to do unit testing as well as do the debugging. Yeah, quickly I'll just tell you about JIT. So JIT stands for just-in-time compilation, right? So, 
so what's happening is like i showed you previously right so compiler will use so many optimization and so many things to ultimately get into binary so sometimes what will happen is your application needs both compile time and the execution time together so there are two things ahead of time compilation and just in time compilation in the ahead of time compilation you will uh, you will do all this kind of optimization and generate a uh, one exe and hand it over to your customers who will repeatedly use your exe so they don't worry about the repeated compilation but whereas uh, there can be other applications which can be present there where in compile time and the execution time are done together so if i want to just give you one dumb example uh, we have seen this online platform like uh, lead code uh, hacker rank uh, code chef everything uh, those kind of things right wherein people will change their code and immediately submit if there are any other uh, any error uh, presented then again change the code and resubmit so they are not rerunning the exe again and again but whereas they are recompiling and rerunning so both of these are included together right in those kind of uh, applications it makes sense to go for this uh, this particular technique called git so where uh, so in this philosophy the thing is you will you will compile your code as well as execute your code then and there so uh, sort of what will happen is you will generate some kind of uh, ir and do some kind of necessary optimization and go into interpreted mode of executing uh, executing the Uh, IR itself at that stage and getting the output using something called JIT engine. So, uh, so this also again uh, evolving area in the LLVM and using this kind of JIT compilation, sometimes the uh, execution can be speed up or uh, you can get the output then and there uh, uh, doing compilation and execution together. Yeah, that was very brief thing about JIT and there are um, uh, these LLVM resources available. Uh, and also i have given the many resources in the each slide itself uh, uh, so the resources are very rich actually in llvm and you can actually go through them and try to uh, understand the compiler i hope this talk gave you at least some sense of compiler and some very basic stuff about what's happening in the black box software